Hey guys, this is Scott. I'm I'm back for a little bit. <laughs> um, I got excited because uh, there's a guy, new guy in town, uh, Gladius, doing um, some awesome work, and uh, he did a he, he's doing some great quality covers, and he did a version of the PyCon theme, which is dear to my heart, because um, being one of my my uh, my actually my last big creation for for dragon ball and and my most well known at the same time um so uh not only he did he do kind of the most accurate version i think i've heard uh but he did a video after that just released i think yesterday um detailing kind of his creation process or logging it um and it was it was so cool to watch him do that because uh, i think it explains sort of you know why he he got such a a good sound um or a similar sound uh because his his kind of process was very similar to the process i used when uh creating the the pycon theme originally um you know, right off the bat, he notices, uh, for instance, that he says, uh, I don't think this is one sound playing here. I think there are multiples layered over each other. And uh, that's very insightful because it's absolutely the case. And, um, and that is how he proceeded uh, to go about you know, replicating the track was this kind of layering. I was impressed with that. Uh, so if you, if you know how I, how I write, um, I mean, if you've watched the interviews with me, you might've heard me say that, uh, what I like to do is, is collect the sounds first that I'm going to use and then write for those because I like to, uh, I don't like to have surprises. Like if I write something and then I, try it with a, a different instrument a lot of times it doesn't sound right to me and then i spend forever trying to find the right thing to play this whatever when i when i could just write i could just find the sound i want and then write something tailored for that instrument and then every nuance is exactly what i want um so so that's what i did with PyCon. now um i i didn't used to talk about the synths that were used uh, if you're if you're kind of a long time subscriber to this channel, you remember, or you might have asked questions or before, I'm, it might have been shut down. Um, it's because I was worried about you know uh, getting in trouble for for you know revealing like trade secrets or something. Um, so, uh, but it's come to my attention several years ago that you know like I, I've received forwarded emails of of Bruce revealing sounds uh that were used for specific things so he you know he's been answering a lot of questions about this kind of stuff um so i figure it's open season it's been 23 years like the jig is up people are figuring this stuff out fast um <laughs> so let's talk about it let's talk about the sense let's talk about pycon let's talk about uh how it was written a bit and uh yeah let's talk about the sense first so um if you don't already know, there are basically two main sound sources for the uh, synths in Dragon Ball. The The first one is the by far the biggest one, um, which is uh, the Alesis QS6, which was something that uh, Mike Smith had originally for his dance band. And uh, he used extensively when they were bidding for the job or he was trying to kind of prove that they could take the job. Yeah, so then they they purchased more so they could get more work done. Um, one for Bruce, and then and then eventually one for me, as well. Uh, and the other the other synth, which uh, you know Bruce has mentioned, I don't think he mentioned it specifically, but um, he's talking about Roland, which uh, is actually my former employer. I worked there for five years. I um, I haven't announced it, but I've I've been working for um, a different company now. That game, com it's literally called that game company. Uh, they did Journey for the PS3, which was the first game not updated for a Grammy. Nothing to do with me. I wasn't there yet. Uh, but but that that's how I work for now. Um, anyway, uh, Roland. 
So uh, at one time, they were kind of uh, the industry standard for samplers. Uh, I, I think it's been contact for a long time now, but um, but at the time, their S760 sampler was kind of the thing if you wanted to do custom samples or, or buy libraries and install them. Um, <clears throat> so so these two libraries are kind of the big things used in Dragon Ball, um, covering a lot of core instruments, like the, the bass, the standard bass guitar that was used all over the place, the electric, the synth electric guitar. There's a lot of synth electric guitar. It wasn't all real, guys. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, and a lot, a lot of the better orchestral sounds came from the, the Roland orchestral family there. And, and uh, most of the drums were from the Roland rhythm section library. Uh, sometimes we use drums from other sources, but by and large, they're um, just a couple of different samples from the... Um, from that library. Uh, and then, if it's a track written by me, it might feature this bad boy, which is the K2500, which I acquired in 1996 while I was in college still, uh, using kind of, um, <laughs> it's embarrassing, but it's trust money uh, that I was given access to. Um, I didn't have full access to it yet, but but they let me dip into it for this uh, and some other gear that were important for me getting started professionally. And the cool thing about it is that it can load uh, Roland samples, it can load Akai samples, it can load, load a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, so I, I, when I started using this at the studio, I could I could just grab samples and put them on zip disk. Or I could load. I could take a CD-ROM and hook it up to it and load sounds, and then uh, yeah, and I've got I've got a hard drive. This thing is busted now, but but yeah, so I can hook up devices to it and load sounds off of it. Um, so I didn't actually have a rule uh, 760, but I could use this, and uh, and so when I worked in the studio, unless I was in the main room, the sounds were coming from QS6. Or this Kurzweil, for me. Um, and today, they're coming from this QS6 or the Roland sounds being loaded onto this and playing out the, uh, the Kurzweil. Or I've, I have I have a... Um, it's not actually a QS6, but I have a, a rack-mounted thing called the QSR. R is for rack. Um, it's not a keyboard. It's like a, a box. And uh, it has all the sounds from the QS8 on it. Because uh, I bought it just before um, my time ended at the studio. And uh, uh, since it's a QS8, of course, a lot of things change. And so I got an expansion card. And that that covers me. Like, I have all the the sounds that um, we used in the show between the whatever's left on board on the QSR or 8 um, and that expansion card. So let's see. So that covers kind of the basic sound sources. Yeah, before I get into more specifics on the, the PyCon theme, I wanted to talk about the, the harmony. Let's talk about the music. Um, so yeah, there, there's uh, s several different covers out there that are awesome. Um, but I don't, think, I don't think any of them have quite exactly got the chord. Some people get different things right. <laughs> There's a couple of uh, zinger chords in there that are, that are tricky. Um, let's see. So, but it's, it's basically classical harmony, um, except for one chord that I call the Darth Vader chord. Um, and it's, it's because like the main Darth Vader theme from John Williams is, uh, is based on two chords, really. If you're in, if you're in a, key, a minor key, it's the one chord, which is home, of course. And uh, and then a chord based on the sixth scale degree flatted, and it's a minor chord. So you call that. Uh, people say it different ways, but I think the popular right now is flat six minor. Um, so so if you're in F, 
playing it up right now. I woke up six calories. One, two, three, four, five, six, or F, G, A, B, C, D. So that is the six calorie, and then you flat it to D flat, which is going down to the next black note, and then you build a minor chord off that. And I won't talk about it either. Um, so you got F minor and D flat minor. It's a very dark sound. Um, and if if I were to play like so, there's different ways to play D flat minor, but here's here's F minor. D, kind of a muddy D flat minor, and I'm gonna play them out. So I'm just gonna swap between those two chords in my left hand. I accidentally played D flat major one time there, but, but you'll forgive me. Um, <laughs> but uh, so that's that's kind of the the basis of the Darth Vader theme, and I think Williams used that concept even before, you know for dramatic modes. Going back to the Fiddler on the Roof, which he won his first Academy Award for, um, believe it or not, before he ever did Star Wars or uh, or Jaws or any of that stuff. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, so PyCon. So PyCon uses the same... And then that Darth Vader chord. So and, then, and then from here, it's mostly just basic harmony. Uh, classical harmony. So the, the the most common chord after one is five. So that's where I go. Um, and they go back to that Darth Vader chord. And then this is what's called a two chord. And in minor, the two chord is what's called what has a quality which is a little bit weird called diminished. And this is a half diminished chord. So it's kind of dissonant. And then back to a five chord playing a inverted version of the E in the bass. And then a, just a four chord, which is another really standard. So that's B flat minor. And then and then uh, there's what's called an augmented chord. It's just another five chord, but I'm changing the top note. And then just a regular C chord. So it's C augmented, C major, and then back to one, which is F minor. So we've had <laughs> kind of a whirlwind. We've had we've had minor chords, we've had major chords, we had a diminished or half diminished chord. Well, I won't explain the difference between full and half uh, here, but um, and and we have an augmented chord. So that's like the three main kinds of what are called triads, uh, and then it repeats. Um, so let's let's play it, and I'll just call out things. F minor. D flat minor, C major, D flat minor, G half diminished, C major, B flat minor, C augmented, C major, F minor. And from here, um, <laughs> I didn't do this on purpose, it's just kind of the way it came out, but... But then I do the one thing that we haven't done, which is a suspended chord. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, uh, let me get, the, I'm gonna actually play the, the original sound. So this is a patch called uh, Chromophon on the Alesis QS6, or I'm playing off the QSR, but, um, so let's, what's the right octave? So that's, it's more, it's more than the suspended chord. That's a, a seven chord suspended, if you know what seventh chords are. I'm not going to go over that either. But, I mean, it's basically a you add the seventh scale degree um, flatted, so the seventh scale degree. Uh, and it, it kind of leaves you hanging. You get one of those to resolve it. But I think the suspended chord has a, a very kind of heroic feel. It's a very uplifting and triumphant and... Um, so that was kind of my way to lead into the beat of the theme um, is to put this big suspended chord after this kind of dark brooding section. Um, and incidentally, uh, I'm going to switch over here to a different sound, which is called Heaven Sent Trunks. Or Heaven Sent. <laughs> There's a track named after it called Heaven Sent Trunks. You may not have known this, but... Uh, 
It's just called that because that's the name of the patch. Um, but um, so so in in the first piece that I ever wrote for the show, uh, which is the second part of Spirit Bomb, which is a really its own piece. Um, I'm using the same kind of harmony, the the suspended four chord, seven chord, um, to get the same kind of heroic uh, sound. And then I play like an F. And then it's the C minor stuff. But, so, um, that's not exactly what I did. I, I mean, I honestly, I improvised that in the original, and I was just improvising just now, so it's not the same. But it's kind of the general idea of what I was playing. Um, using those, those suspension sounds that create a heroic... Uh, feel. Um, so that's what that thing is doing leading into the PyCon theme. Probably too much explanation there. So let's see. Uh, so I was going to get it. Oh yeah. So from here, I'm going to start talking about uh, what that, what well, the sense that are, that build that opening brooding section before we get into the, the beat and stuff. Um, so uh, as uh, Gladius noticed when he was trying to figure out the theme um he noticed he said this is more than more than one patch and which is you know kind of the mistake a lot of people make um they think it's one patch and they ask what is that sound that you're using and uh or and and to get very further they'll be like what what soft sense or what sound font or whatever and like guys we didn't use sound fonts this is the days of hardware synths um but anyway, uh, so so it's more what you might call a synth stack, because um, I had, like I said, I had gone through and collected a whole bunch of sounds that I want that I thought sounded good, and then I would just, you know, like why pick one? Just layer them. <laughs> like maybe I found okay, this is kind of what I want, but it's missing some element, so I just throw something else on top. Um, so let's just start going through and, and uh, playing some of the sounds that were used in that opening. And uh, most of them were native to the Kurzweil on that, that beginning. So here's one. Uh, I'm just scrolling through uh, finding things I remember. So this one's called Solina Phase, which I think was used in there. Or an octave up. Okay, probably used in there anyway. This one's definitely, here we go. It's called Spaced. And this one's used a lot after the breeding session. So this this is another one, um, and it's actually used uh, in the Android 17 and 18 theme as well. I'm gonna try to do this. Uh, originally, I did this in two passes. Uh, there's a kind of a here. I'll just give you a demo real quick. You can turn this mod wheel. Changes the filter on the strings. That's uh. So, so what I did was I um, played the notes first and then I did the mod wheel stuff later. But I'm going to try to do it at the same time here. Wait, wrong archive, I think. Uh... So that's kind of the, the dark brooding part of the Android's theme. Um, and in, in uh, PyCon, it's, it's like this. Oh, B 
happy for mig. So there's that. Here's another one called Choir Fixer. Or let's see how what do I maybe like that. Let's see what else. This one probably wasn't used, but I'm gonna play it just while we're here. Um this is called Launchpad, and uh, I had frequently used it just for big dramatic moments. It was my big choir sound. The, there's a there's like a main DBZ choir sound, which I'm not going to talk about too much, but um, uh, that we used extensively, and it was available to everybody at the studio um, via the Roland sampler. But, uh, but sometimes I was lazy, because I had to actually have to load that one up, and so I would just use this instead, because it was native to my keyboard. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that one's actually in the PyCon theme though, but but it, it's a it was one of my favorites. So this next one, um, uh, uh, Gladius said he noticed choir, so this is where that's coming from. This one's called uh, "When You Wash." And this is kind of fun because it um, it wasn't included with the keyboard originally. Uh, well, it, they gave it. They gave me some, believe it or not, floppy disks <laughs> when I got the keyboard. Like, Here's some floppy disk with some extra sounds because this thing has a, a floppy disk reader right here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the sounds that was on like a disc of choir sounds uh, was this thing called Windy Wash. And I think it's kind of fun to do an edit on it. And you can hear like, let's see. So it's the whole thing. Now if I, if I mute the first two layers, it's got this wind sound, so that's why it's windy. And then choir sound and it's got some strings which I, I might have edited that out because I already had strings from the ethereal strings but I don't know I don't remember exactly what I did but that's oh yeah and and uh, later I found out that sound uh, was on Kurzweil's FTP site like that's the only place I've, I don't know where it came from actually they just gave me these discs and I don't know where they got them um, they look like they've been copied by somebody, but, um, but years later I noticed I was like snooping around and they had this public FTP. I don't know if you ever use FTP. It's kind of weird to protocol to connect to, but you could go on and dig around and, and this choir sound was on their public FTP. I don't know if it's still there or available or whatever. That was many years ago, but, uh, yeah. So that's when he wash, which we had lots of choir sounds, but and I like that one um, and used it for a few things. And PyCon is one of the things it's in. Okay, let's talk about the the drum beat because after after that uh, the chromophon suspended chord leads into the, the kind of first version of the drum beat. Now this drum beat, um, if, when the full version of it anyway is uh, my a friend of mine is like, man, that is a complicated. <laughs> Trumpy, how did you do that? Um, and uh, and I don't really think of it like that. I was just trying to my my head. I was trying to emulate like Mike Smith's kind of hi hat style that I had really grown to admire, and so I wanted to try my hand at that. And um, and yeah, the, it, I've come to realize that beat is pretty tough to play. Like I, I got a, a electronic kit and, that I've been trying to learn to play and I've attempted that beat and man, it's a doozy. But, um, but the way I recorded it was actually very simple, um, and easy to do. Uh, it's wait, let me pull up some drums. 
So, um, I basically just recorded it in layers and two separate takes. So, uh, <clears throat> so first was the hi hats. And let's see if I can do this right. And then you record it, and then you can kind of fix the rhythm automatically. Um, so I played that into a, a metronome, and then I had this kind of interesting syncopated hi hat thing going on and just i'm just playing two notes on the keyboard and then with that recorded and playing back and the metronome yeah so and then i just uh played in the kick and snare i'm probably not gonna play it exactly right but So, you know, and I could be kind of complicated because that's all I'm doing, just like playing with these two notes. Um, and then and then they come together nicely into this uh, rich sounding beat. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, which is actually in 6-4 time, um, which is which is what the chords are in. Um, so uh, six, six beats for each. So it's something like one, two, three, four, Fail. One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 So I needed a I needed a six beat uh drum beat to match those chords. And so that was what I came up with. Um that that pattern interesting thing about that is that uh when the chorus comes in the are the arpeggios arpeggios are just chords played broken up and um and that that part is in four 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 beats and and i was lazy and i didn't change the drum beat <laughs> so you've got this uh six four going against four four which i think is kind of interesting and cool um so that happens in the piece, uh, which makes it I don't know, kind of progressive, but it was really just me being lazy, to be honest. Um, let's see. Uh, let's talk about the break. Uh, there's this break section, and uh, this is where it gets a bit more orchestral. Um, let's see, and then we're using uh, the Roland orchestral family library there. There's this patch called Marcato Strings. Um, there's a symphonic version of it. They had like, if you want to get really fancy, you can get, use the, like the uh, the violin Marcato, the cello Marcato, contrabass. Marcato. We didn't usually do that. I mean, it's grabbed. There's one that's like the whole symphony, just all of it. Um, and uh, so you'll definitely recognize this. I think the one we used for the show was a little bit more smooth out. Um, but this is as it is. Well, I edited. I since I had to load on the Kurzweil, things get a little messed up when you load it on the wrong synthesizer. So I had to uh, adjust how the sounds kind of fall off for this. But um, so you'll recognize the sound. I should probably maybe put down an octave. Yeah, and I mean, like you'll recognize that stuff from it's all over Dragon Ball. That that patch is everywhere. <clears throat> Let's see. And then let's talk about uh, the drums there. So um, uh, Gladius showed himself uh, editing that drum beat, the, the drum fill, which was cool because he did it um, similar to the way I did it. Again, um, I was impressed with that. So, like, so yeah, a lot of times I play things in, which is kind of what, the way we're supposed to do it. Uh, you get more of a natural feel. But this is one exception where... 
I don't know. I just didn't do that. Like, I did it basically the same way that Gladys did it. I drew out a bunch of notes that were all the same. And, and they were the hi-hat, so let's go back. Yeah. So, I mean, me playing it sounds like crap because it because these were, like, it's just a string. I did this on the curse wheel. So, um... So what I did, I think, probably was record a bunch of them in and then and then i did a, a crescendo edit on so you can you can modify the velocities or the, the loudness of each note and to to make it ramp from low to high and then so i did that which is basically what gladius did in his editor and then um but i did one extra step which is that you have these beats so there's four of those hi-hats per beat so so, so that was kind of cool. I accidentally hit the open. Um, <laughs> uh, so I just put a little spike at the beginning of each beat, so you get more of a natural the way the the way a drummer would. Um, terribly performed, um, but yeah, it was co this computer was doing it basically, uh, so it was perfect. And 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 I already had this nice crescendo so all i had to do is you know just raise the beginning of each note a little bit in the editor in the list editor um and it created a really dynamic sounding uh fill and i was so happy with that i was like okay let's let's pump it up even more for the last bit of it and i'll bring in the snare and do the exact same kind of edit job so i did the or just replicated what i'd done from the hi-hat for the snare so you hear that so you first hear, and then and it kicks off again into the chorus, or I think it's how it starts in the first chorus. Um, yeah. Oh, and I should go back to the beat because uh, that full version of the beat is not what I actually launch into after the suspension chord. Um, it's just yeah, because the full beat's like wait. Whatever it is. And then and then, but but I realized I needed to have kind of a chill, more chill section leading into before I got to the full beat. So I just cut out a lot of the snares, and it's just like, whatever. It, um, yeah, so just a basically more chill beat. And then, then we have the break, and then it launches into the, the full beat. Um, yeah, so that was kind of my, my process there. So I guess we're going to, we're up to the chorus, right? Um, where the thing I was talking about this in four, four, and it is like conflicting with the drums. It actually has another way it's conflicting. We'll get into that. Um, but first let's, let's talk about the sound that was used there. Um, the sound is called screamer and it's off the, uh, the QS six. So, so this sound is what you call a monophonic sound. Um, if I hit one note and I hit another note, the next note is just going to replace that one. You can only have one note at a time. So, um, yeah. So it's used for leads and stuff. And, um, and my idea here was just, I don't know why, um, but it's really simple actually. I, uh, it's just an F minor triad. So it's th three notes, just three notes. So F, A flat, C. Those are the notes of an F minor chord. Um, and then I did the same thing with this hand. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then I went down. So I stayed going, so up. And then back down. And then you just do it really fast. Um, and then, and then what you do uh, is, uh, I, all I'm doing is, so it's just three notes, remember? And there's the middle note is A flat. So I'm just taking that middle note and I'm moving it up one to a B flat and then moving it down Wait, wait. Right, so then I'm moving it to a G, so below the original A flat, 
and then back up to an A flat. So, so if I ever just play those notes, and I can start to add together notes, maybe just the bottom ones. And we get out. Now I'm going to add the C on top. So. So, and I, I never could play this well. Like, it was all, it was probably worse than this before. Um. <laughs> so, I basically just play it in slow. You know, turn the tempo down, turn the click down, and play it in. Um. Now, I'm going to explain something weird about this, this sequence of notes. It seems, and it is very simple, like, in concept, you know, I'm just, they got three notes in each hand, and I'm going up and down with it, you know, up, um, but there's something about this that works out really strange. If you count, uh, these notes, you got one, two, three, four, five. Now we're at the top. One, two, three, four, five. 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 Now five is a very unusual n number in music. <laughs> Usually you divide a beat into four parts or three parts or, you know, something like that. But five parts is, is very strange especially when your beat is divided into four or two. Like, it doesn't doesn't line up. It's a kind of weird what they call polyrhythm. Now, um, it probably doesn't sound that weird because I'm playing these things so fast, right? It's like... And, and uh, yeah, but the trick is, is I need it to sound perfect because... It was going to sound, I mean, it was going to sound wonky anyway. I think to this day, I still think it sounds a little weird because cause you got this five against four thing going on. Um, but it was going to sound even worse if they were imperfect. So this is one case where I, like, like, you know, we were supposed to not uh, do what's called quantize things completely so it sounded robotic. But this is a case where I absolutely went all the way. Um because I I was so scared it's gonna sound wonky because of this five against four thing, um, so I quantized the drums completely, and then and then I needed to quantize this lead part, um, but you know I'm working with this thing, and even even like in a a modern dot or sequencer or computer on your program, a program on your computer, um, it's a weird thing to to try to tell it to exactly make it even five notes per beat. Um, and especially on this guy. So, so what I, and, and it's not the graphical editor that you have on, on modern computers. It's just like a list of things that happen. And some of them happen to be notes and they each have a number, a timestamp assigned to them. Um, so I'm looking at those and th I have to hand, quantize it uh to make it perfect so so i literally went in i took how many there's a, like a certain number of ticks per beat so 480 ticks per beat and i had to divide that by five which gives you 96 <laughs> so i'm counting by 96 to put each note in so wait i've got a thing that tells me what it is so the first note that one was a zero Next note goes at 96 ticks. Next one goes at 192 ticks. Because 96 plus 96 is 192. And then next one is at 288. Next one is at 384. And next one's 480. Which is completing a beat, so it's also zero. Because <clears throat> we're now in the second beat. And then you repeat the process. So this is zero, which you already did. And then. 96, 192, 288, 384, and zero. So I did that for all of the notes. 
<laughs> in the chorus tediously like went through all in, in a in a modern sequencer i probably would have just done you know like one arpeggio up and down and then copy paste it around but and you could do that with this too um but it was so clunky i don't think i did that i think i just fixed them all um so that's a weird thing about uh, the PyCon thing you may not have known is that progressive. Uh, it's got it's got five tuplets or ten tuplets probably because they're so fast, going over sixteenth or eighth notes and sixteenth notes, and also the drum beats in six four over six over a four four uh, pattern. Um, yeah, it doesn't sound that wild, but it's but yeah, there's there's some wild stuff going on in there. I'm gonna move on to the uh, the next part, which is. Uh, I, I always like to have multiple feels for each character. Uh, PyCon didn't stick around for very long, so I don't, I don't think we even used this stuff. Um, but I wanted some slow stuff. So, so uh, I have this sound that I love off the QS called Henyaz. And uh, my second video ever on YouTube, which is the Sageism track. I didn't call it that right away. I think I called it... Well, anyway. Um, so that track is it starts out with just me improvising with the henyas and that is basically exactly what i did and um and the pycon theme i had this thing as i was learning to write and learning to play where i just kind of play a quarter note pulse on whatever chord or maybe just a bass note and i learned to play whatever rhythm on top of that and so here let me select that sound and then I would just make up melodies over top of that. And sometimes, you know, like so, so here we go. Sometimes play a little interesting. And start to add something on top. So that's, of course, not exactly what's in the PyCon theme. I don't actually know the, the thing because I improvised it. Like, I just recorded some stuff and put it in there. And, and that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just playing some stuff. Um, and that's what I did in Sagism, too. Like, that whole whole Sagism, uh, it's two videos because back then um, you could only upload 10 minutes at a time. Um, but I recorded it as, like, a 20-minute improvisation and then split it up and uploaded it to YouTube. Um, but so, so that's what the, that last section of PyCon is. I didn't, I didn't like compose out, you know, separate parts or whatever. It's just one, mostly just one sound. Yeah, then I can go clean up weird things, you know, in the editor. Um, and uh, I think there's a video, there's this jazz musician who, like, um, just speaking off the cuff, but he, I haven't even watched this video, but I've seen this uh, thumbnail for where he's talking about John Williams and the E minor uh, 7 half diminished chord and how it's, like, I could just predict what he's talking about in there, but it's, 
it's kind of the the same thing I'm doing at PyCon. So this is G G half diminished chord. So it's this that sound right there, just so emotional. And I think John Williams does that too. And and I I haven't watched the video, but I've just predicted that, that that is what this guy is talking about. I wish I could remember his name. Um, he's, yeah, he's done a lot of cool jazz videos. Um, but I'm keeping this pedal of an F down here, even though I've gone to a G half diminished chord. So G, B flat, D flat. That. So that's that's a big part of what makes that um, ending emotional sounding. Uh, another thing that makes it emotional, of course, is the sounds. Um, there's really I think that whole ending sa sa slow part is just two sounds. Um, the other is an amazing, another amazing sound that I love off the QS. It's called Spaceport. And um, so, yeah, I just slopped in an improvisation. It was probably, I think it was the first take with the Henyaz. And then, and then I just <laughs> finger just this awesome uh, sustain sound. And whatever I played with it, it. Now, this version of Spaceport, it's the multi timbral version on the QS. That means, like, it's, I've got the QS in this mode where it can pull like a whole bunch of parts at the same time. Now, when I recorded the PyCon themes slow part, I didn't sequence it out. It wasn't programmed into MIDI like the rest of the song was, um, or the whole first section, fast parts of the song. Um, I was just free playing it in. And uh, so I could use the entire QS for one sound. So I believe I was in what's called program mode. I was playing. Uh, so I had the full, better version of Spaceport than what you're hearing there. Um, so it was that much more impactful, I think. Um, yeah, both Henyaz. I don't know if the Henyaz is really much different in, uh, in multi-mode and program mode. But uh, I think Spaceport is. Um so anyway, that's the slow part. Oh yeah, and I was gonna I said I was gonna go back to the chorus. So there's there's an extra line that comes in that makes it even more climactic. And I believe it is Henyaz again. Um and I've I've heard this in covers where it's like like that kind of thing. But um here's here's what it actually is. So I'm just basically, uh, I'm playing octaves. So it's, it's almost the same thing as what the other one is because these are both Fs, right? So you can go. Or you can alternate the octaves, which is what I did. So <laughs> that's that little tidbit. And I think it was actually Henyaz, uh, uh, again, uh, in that part. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's what that sound was. Let's see. So now we're on to the very end. Uh, now, this has a little bit of an interesting story, which is that um, what I've gone over now was the original ending of the PyCon theme. I was done. And I handed it off to uh, Ben Kasparek, who was our, uh, our top editor. And um, he comes back to me, and he, he was a fan of the show before... He worked at the studio. He was the only one of us who was like that. I mean, I was definitely a fan, but I had I didn't really watch the show before I uh, I joined. Um, so, but, but Ben was really more in tune than any of us um, as to what was hap going to happen in this show because he knew it ahead of time. I mean, I had watched a little bit ahead of time, but I didn't really um, didn't have it as ingrained in me as much as he did. So he he's like Scott, we need this. Uh, we need something 
for PyCon, he has this special ability. It's like a, I forget what it's called, like a cyclone attack or vortex or something. And uh, he's like, we really should have, like he does this, you know, swirling motions with his arms. And we need something special for that. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with something. I'll th throw it at the end of the track. And so, uh, so it didn't take me very long um, to figure it out. But, and I, I think I just got lucky. Like, I don't know. But my thought was, okay, swirling tornado, just more arpeggios. Of course, you know, arpeggios are like when you break up a chord, play it note by note. Just like we were doing with the, uh, with the screamer sound. It's funny because, like, um, you know, uh, Gladius mentioned that <laughs> the the PyCon theme was like a like a lesson in, in arpeggiation arpeggiators. It's funny because I don't I don't actually use a single arpeggiator almost ever. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of things that use arpeggios, uh, which is where arpeggiators create. But I, I tend to do them by hand. Um, like like I was talking about how that that chorus is hand quantized to ten tuplets. Um, and the ending is no different. Like I actually free played that, uh, but I'll show you how there's a trick. There's definitely a trick. I, I'm not that good. Um, <laughs> so, oh yeah, I was going to mention that, that I, I do, I have used an arpeggiator and, but it, the biggest time I can think of that I use arpeggiator is the video called Ginyu Jam. And I, uh, and I wanted something that sounded really perfect and I could jam on, uh, and still sound really locked because that that guinea theme has this really tight rhythmic drone and i didn't want to screw that up i know i couldn't do it without like an arpeggiator perfecting it for me so so that video uses an arpeggiator and i'm kind of just like changing it constantly um but anyway so that that's an arpeggiator but uh, almost everywhere else if you hear an arpeggiator from me it's either maybe a sound that has a built-in arpeggiator sometimes that happens um like what, what i'm about to show you um, or I'm just programming it directly, like with the, the chorus. Anyway, let's get on. Let's show you this, uh, patch here. Now, this is patches, the other big patch and the 1718 theme, actually the PyCon and the 1718 share some key parts. Very different themes, but, um, so this patch is called Aurora and it's, uh, it's on the, the Kurzweil <coughs> and, um, and uh, the one that's in 1718 is not actually Aurora. It's a, a kind of a modification, modified version of it that I pulled off one of the floppy disks that I have. Um, and it's the one for uh, 1718, I think it has a little bit of vibrato added to it. And it's uh, maybe has some filtering on it to make it sound more tinty. So it sounded creepier, which is why I used it. Um, and I think it might be a little bit slower too. But this one, um, so you just hit it note by note. And I'm going to play you the, the 1718 theme. Wait, that's too fast. Still too fast, but... I think. So that's... Very, very similar to the sound that was used for 1718. But it is the sound used for... For the end of PyCon. Um... Because basically the idea is that it's... You're getting octaves. It's like one. Oh, sorry, that's not octaves. Like I can manually play octaves. Um, maybe I should change a different sound. So that's what I'm doing myself. But then this one just does it for me. Um, and then if you just kind of tap it, you get a little bit of it. So my thought was, so since they're octaves, I can do whatever I want with it. It's not a full arpeggio. Um, I can play chords with it and it'll be fine. Um, so that, so what if I do some crazy arpeggios with that sound? What kind of mess is that going to create? <laughs> I'm a better pianist than I used to be. Um, cause it's been 23 years. Um, I'm still not that great. But I think I'm a little better. So if I probably now, if I was going to perform it, I would try to do it for real. Um, and I would do something like.
So that's actually better than my takes I did <laughs> previously. Um, but yeah, so so that's probably how I do it nowadays. Um, since I'm better at piano than I used to be, but uh, but that's not how I recorded it. Uh, I did do it live. Um, it uses this, a silly trick that I got from, believe it or not, Jordan Rudis. Um, I don't know if you know who Jordan Rudis is, but he's the the keyboardist for Dream Theater. And at the time, he was not the uh, well. I don't know when he joined, but he was he wasn't the original keyboardist for Dream Theater. And and um, before that, uh, he spent he at least spent some contract or employee time. I don't know what the setup was, but he apparently worked for Kurzweil, the make, people who make this keyboard. Um, <laughs> because when you buy this keyboard. Uh, originally, it came with a VHS tape because this keep this cover is pretty vast. I mean, it's the technology; it's called vast, actually. Um, <coughs> uh, there's a lot of stuff in there, and so it's like a movie length VHS tape with just tons of tutorials and going over all the different sections of the keyboard and how to use it. And it's Jordan Rudis, back before he was big famous guy doing um, Dream Theater. Uh, he's basically leading you through the tech and ripping crazy piano riffs as he's as he's demoing stuff um but one of the thing and it's funny because the, the the thing that i used for, the trick that i used for pycon was not something that uh that was some fancy deep trick within the keyboard no it, it was it was just a stupid thing that you could do with a casio with an octave button um <laughs> and it was surprising to me that that it was jordan Ruse who taught this because you know he's such an amazing piano player but here he is teaching this like hack. <laughs> so I'll show you what it is. It, it's simple. You know, if, if arpeggios are just me playing the same three notes in different places, like 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 I was showing you before with <laughs> it's the three notes and the same three notes up here. And then you, you can do a roll, you know, you just go one hand over the other. So instead of like trying to fly all over the keyboard, you could just Keep your hand in one place and press the octave button. Down, up, down button. Octave up button. Octave down button. Octave up button. Octave down button. That's how I did it. But not completely. So, uh, so one last trick. Um, so that's that's the main part of the sound. It sounds pretty close already. Uh, but there's that heaven sent sound that was used in Spirit Bomb, and it, it wasn't enough by itself. But I thought, okay, I want some more sparkles, like what <laughs> more crazy stuff. So that that one doesn't arpeggio, but it has this like bouncing sound. So just add more craziness. So so basically, what I did was I uh, it's two different synthesizers. You got the Kurzweil, and you got the QS and I can play the local sound on the QS. I mean, on the Kurzweil doing that Aurora octave thing. <coughs> and I can have it also send MIDI to the, to the QS and play the heaven sent sound, the same notes. And I didn't program this in. I just played it live. Um, so, so this is what it sounds like. Now we're getting heaven sent. Like if I turn the volume down on the Kurzweil, this just heaven sent. So and then you do the trick. Maybe maybe the balance is a little different. Anyway, so I mean I, I probably won't get the exact performance I did. Um, cause I'm just randomly hitting in the octave up and down buttons. So one thing I want to talk about with that, uh, that, that's basically it. I mean, I just did that and then let it finish out and just tried to do the best performance I could and record the straight audio of what I was, uh, playing in. And, and that was the sound effect for Ben. Um, which is funny cause like, I didn't consider it to be the end of the piece. Um, it was just. Just a sound effect that I tagged onto the end of the, uh, in the audio file that I gave him, and then later, like it like started to solidify itself in my head. Is I mean, that's kind of cool. Like, 
the piece had this soft ending, then there's a pause, and then there's this big musical flourish, and it, like, it's a pretty cool idea. I wish I had had it like that, it, but it wasn't intentional at all. It literally was just a sound effect I tagged to, tagged to the end of it um, for at Ben's request. Yeah, so and, and I want to go a little further. Um, I did a piece called Forgotten Warrior, uh, and I think in 2007 when I was doing my Z Music album, and it was basically uh, another take of PyCon, and this time I <laughs> put a gangster, I don't know why I put a gangster beat. Uh, I was actually making fun of other artists for taking everything and put a gangster beat to it, and then I did it to my own stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to take it a little further. Um, cause, cause in, in the end of PyCon, it's just one chord. It's just like, you know, my hands just staying right here. Well, what if you started changing chords? I didn't love that, but... So, so the, uh, there's, I used the same sound in Forgotten Warrior over to the drum beat, and you hear it moving through some chords. Um... And another thing I did to kind of take it more forward is, is there's something I hadn't been utilizing. This thing actually has a speed dial on it. So I can turn this knob here. So I did separate passes where I was like... Uh, So you hear those kind of things in the Forgotten Warrior version that weren't in there. And then while I was uh, doing takes for this video here, I realized something, kind of a missed opportunity I could have done with the original. Like, you know, you had those chords at the beginning. Well, what if I had done this? What if I had done this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know something could have been done with that. Um, I think it's fun to play the like the main theme using that crazy rolling arpeggio sound. Um, so anyway, I hope you like that. Uh, I think that's all I have to say, and um, except that it, you know I appreciate anybody who like takes the time to do covers of something I've written. It's it's such an honor. Um, yeah, all the all the different versions. There's a there's a retro video game PyCon thing that I think is amazing. Uh my friend my friend Lewis, uh who does uh who does animations, um did did a, a, a really cool cover of of the PyCon theme and uh and I don't know, I've seen a bunch of other ones um out there and I just appreciate I've seen people cover it on guitar, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> I haven't even tried that myself. Well, I've, I've played around with it on my own, but it was freaking hard to play those arpeggios on guitar. Anyway, uh, so thank you so much, guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't too long and detailed or whatever, but, um, yeah, I hope you found it interesting. And I'll see you next time. I'll try not to make it too long <laughs> from now. Have, have a good one.